Welcome to Gestalt Poetry Open Mic for July 2024. We are blessed to be here today. I'm so excited to hear our feature poet Tolu Akinyemi today, as well as all of our fellow poets. Our feature poet for next month is Laura Grevel on October, October, August 24th. And uh, big news, I have sinus surgery on August 7th, and I'll be out for a while healing for that from that. Um, graciously, Raw M. James and Laura will be guest hosting and co-hosting. If you'd like to perform, please contact Laura, and we're going to have the event out in the next week or so. Um, we're going to open up the open mic next, but first, please give us a trigger warning if you're performing anything explicit or possibly upsetting to others today. And I'm gonna post the feature in the fellow poets. And if you're not on the list, please send me a direct message. First off, we have Bienvenu Ruhugita, and I want to promote his wonderful book. I'm gonna put his information about how to order the book, either directly on the website of the publisher or through Western Union, which is how I got mine. And it is a clear, poignant, uh, salient, and raw expression of being a, a refugee. And I look forward to hearing his performance today. Welcome, bienvenue. Would you like to perform now? Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Hello, guys. Welcome. Yo, my name is Bienvenue Rigita. I'm a poet here in Zaleka refugee camp. But DRC, which is Democratic Republic of Congo. You're I'm a refugee since 2014. I mean, since I was seven years old, and now I'm 70 years old in a refugee camp. I decided to come up with a book which is called Run to Save a Shadow, as one way to help the community here and to also support me in my side. And on another hand, I'm a refugee, but also unfortunately sad, an orphan who lost his father when I was seven. And I, I lost my father when I was five years old in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And we get separated with my mother in the same year. I'm living with my uncle and auntie here in Malawi. So I really need your support on the book on terms of sales. That man will really help me and to really support me in many ways and really support the community here. So I'm going to form one of the poem, which is called Last Celebration. The poem is entitled Last Celebration. Here it goes. <clears throat> I was born as not count as an orphan. When I grow up, problem faces me. Evening to be born the new following day I lost my father. I live some years, my mother disappeared. I feel the pile of tears. All words have ears. My first time for me to see the light, the world was glowing. My mother was laughing as a loser who became a winner. But now saliva is tasting bitter. Her body has lived for two months. Relatives are mocking for marriage debt. They grab the property before we bury their body. Cashless is a punishment. Today we are gathering like a choir. Is image cracking a black white attire. Expensive bottle in our faces. Minds are hot for her divorce, begging her heart to beat the drum, and the rivers are shedding tears. 
my future smell short and dry. And nobody can deny. Pastors are reading last rhyme of her life, and controlling their mood like verses of poems and proverbs. She has left a lesson and pens in my brains. Looking at her dirty face, skeleton smiling to me, her middle mind crying for help. I have lost my torch in dark. Where can I park? The belt calendar appear and disappear. Today is her birthday and she has passed away. Neighbors are crying like mechanics with no ideas. The last celebration in my life. My mind is a range of storm ridden rain. Her cares march me to live tears. I love her and hate her is true, but I'll never forget her treatment. I wish to follow her, putting my life in hot. Hardly think I never cross in a pot, which lost a long relation. And I'm not supposed to live on this earth, because I have no parents. Sorrowful songs are sung. A journey to live in dairy center. Nobody weeped to cure my soul. Busy planting a body, applying manure on a body, planning to crop up tyrant of sorrows. Mentality is honey, and I'm homeless. Noise, then quiet. I peel my eyes and they want to fall from socket. It couldn't thrown down for fear because of the peace of the grapes. And I'm parentless. The barren human is up, saying that you want to be my savior, hiding me in my comfort zone. I question her, where is my mother? My father died when I was five, and now I'm a true orphan, and my mother was here yesterday. Traditional leaders were alive. Then I was told to be active because my mom is a felling tree. And someone has chopped her from me at funeral, the last celebration in my life. Uh, thank you. I'm going to perform also a short poem about Africa. A very short poem about Africa. Can you give me a time, Mami Hami? Okay. Here it goes. Africa is a forest where hunts are queens and grasshoppers are kings. Africa is a melting pot which borrow their own things from others. And I am the only son from the windowed mother who will never stop crying until all Africans put on shoes. I'm Coming from a poor family, where we were poorly educated, our houses are made from bamboos, covered with coconut leaves, chains of high mountains surrounding us, and there were no way to communicate with others. My mother died in silence of pains. It hacked but was forded by stream of life. Father died of nothing in the pockets. Life is heavily weighted in Africa. Children are grave diggers of elders, dying of stinking goals and dreams of them. It is cruelly emotional stint from pure feelings. Orphans are all over, including I. We sing and sang songs as warriors. War made Africans love traders. People flee the fighting and became refugees with no identities but only carrying nationalities. Anger is terrible, but not to us. Life in Africa has no hotel. We fought to patriotism, but fell. Africa is a fraction of a cell, extending labors of frogness. We mourn and weep for it, but the national anthem has no sense. Poverty, the homeland of Africans. We kept and kept hair. Our claws are wrought with each on them. Our feet of ears with no shoes, toys are stinking out day by day, dancing us yesterday and today, and the bare hands hurt as machines. We do and transport everything by our hands. Our continent is full of calamities. 
We never dream of stepping in richness. We look all right than various potential of the earth, but we're innocent to bending bonds, fighting against this disease, which is hitting our lives and brains, and it is called poverty. Poverty, the homeland of Africans. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bienvenue. That was so powerful and it teaches us so much. Your perspective teaches us so much. And please do buy Bienvenue's book if you can. And if you can also please write a review and that will help sales as well. Anything else you'd like to say? Yeah, what I'd like to say is only I'm looking for support and help from you guys. I'm really looking for support from you. I'm really looking for support from you. Coming back in this way because the money that you're going to support is not like I'm going to eat it alone. The money is going to support, like, for example, I'm having six of my young brothers and sisters here we are living together so we are all both orphans so that's money will support us we can buy even 10 cases of maize for us to eat it even for two days that support to real and real appreciate even god will see on you guys mm -hmm. i really need and i'll leave us the number of whatsapp which i'll be using anyone wishing to have a copy please contact me on whatsapp or facebook please you can contact the mother Hami there on facebook or somewhere else she will give you the direction and i'll also provide you the copy of my book which is called run to save your shadow i really need your support i really need your support that is what i can say Thank you so much. And please do try to support Bienvenue. Beautiful poetry. We so appreciate you being here. Thank you. Now, do we have... Thank you, madam. Oh, you're welcome. Do we have Mili Das from India? Is she here? I don't believe so. All right. It's time for our feature. Tolu, I'm going to introduce you first. And then... You're welcome to have your performance. Okay. All right. Tolu Akunyemi, aka Tolu Toludo and the Lion of Newcastle, is a multiple award-winning author in the genres of poetry, short stories, children's literature, and essays. He is a former headline act at Great Northern Slam, Havering Literary Festival, Crossing the Tyne Festival, Feltonbury and Art Musical Festival, The Stanza and The Cooking Pot. He has appeared as a featured guest on BBC Radio, Spark Sunderland, Wright Radio, Sheffield Live 93.2 FM and Coast 106.6 FM, among others. He is a co-founder of Lion and Lilac, a UK-based arts organization and sits on the board of many organizations. Please welcome Tolu. Thank you, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here this evening. And thank you, Amy, for having me as well. I'm delighted to, to be here tonight. Yeah, so um, I will start by reading the first poem from my collection of poems, A Booktiful Love. But before we proceed, can I have a loud roar like a lion? Can you and Gita just all roar together? Can I have a loud roar like a lion? <laughs> Thank you. I'll take that. Yeah, so the first one is from my collection of poems, A Book to Full Love, and this poem is titled Bury Me in a Library. Write my name on a map where my time is up. Give me a statue, a gigantic statue, 
bury me with a catalog of books. Don't railroad my chance to walk this hall of fame with a badge of honor. You say, no smoke without fire. Lightning is dust and we're consumed in the hail of fire. Draw me with all my imperfections. Catch me with my fields, with my scars and wrinkles, mistakes and joy, sorrows and dreams. Erase nothing, for when I go, I want to go clean. Write my name in the sands of time before my sun goes down and twilight arrives. Thank you. Then the, uh, the next poem I'll be performing is titled A Booktiful Love, which is the title, for, title poem for the collection of poems in Booktiful Love. A Booktiful Love, take a listen. Our love was layered in similes and metaphors. Your love language was erotica, and meeting you was non-fiction. I tell you stories colored in fantasy and send you off to dreamland with poetry, rhymes and free-flowing verses. This isn't science fiction or historical fiction. This was us. There are days I'm buried in the pit of self-help books. I read seven ways to be a good husband and five steps to show a woman untainted love. Never say how to be a good wife. Mute it. Just be silent. It might lead to horror stories. A little humor spiced up with romance, and our love will be a picture book. This isn't a mystery or thriller. It's just me, a young adult living in fantasy. I will make you the lead character in my debut novel, a work of young adult fiction. I will, write, I will write out your name in bold in my memoir and autobiography. Don't say fiction. This is pure and unadulterated love, a booktiful love. Thank you. Yeah, so the next one I will read from a booktiful love as well. This is titled Isolation. And this is, I wrote this during the COVID times. And this is, I'm sure everyone would resonate with an aspect of this point, isolation, once again. The waves of disruption swept us into isolation. We stayed home in trepidation, behind jadows, blue rose became royalty, highly exalted, and the aunt for sanitizers left us blue and weary. Every new day we grieved the dead and every essential shopping trip was escapulated with Moby Dread. Our lives hung on the tread like a scene on the land of the dead. The sight of mass graves made every breath feel like a prized possession. We wore the news and the news fell our hearts until the gloom crept from the screens into our souls. Wrecking havoc so fatal like mortar blows. Some government wrapped their arms around slitting shoulders and protected their vulnerable, while some others showed their true colors. Desecrate the common world whilst the people cling to the strings of survival. Heroes were born, with some dying in active service. I will lower the flag at half staff. Yes. They were sacrificial lambs on the altar of compassion in service to humankind. Conspiracy theories flew on wings and closest, closest races went on the rampage. The crescendo of ignorance was intercontinental. New words like quarantine, social distancing, and stay on to save lives became a revival song. After this pandemic art is bloodthirsty reign of pain and sorrow, we will learn to live in the way once known without the horror of isolation. We will hold hands in reckless abandon. We will lock tongues and sway our bodies to new music. We will dream again of a future without the pain of isolation. Thank you. So the next poem I've written is post. So it's a post isolation poem. And this is from my collection of poems in God in the Human Body. And this is titled Thankful. 
the world was losing steam like a car engine overheating on the motorway. The sound bites from the news were jarring. Apocalypse came and looked the other way. We burst into a bubble of sparkling joy. This revival, we have no losers. We are thankful for the blue sky, still blue, the sunshine breaking into a bubble of delight. The moon rays our basket of hope. The evil winds did not break us. We are the unbroken generation who survived the raging pandemic. This nostril, blowing light wind is coming like the sea. Pause and reflect, pause and cry, cry and pause, cry in buckets, cry tears of joy, cuddle your tears. Hope is here at last. Hope was never lost. Can't you see the connecting dots that kept our light aflame? I can see the flame in your eyes, the sheer joy erupting like a volcano, the beam of thanks pouring down like rain from the heavens. This poem would wrap itself in gratitude, breaking forth like spring fountains. Immerse yourself in gratitude with a roaring scream of thanks. A new beginning is air, new beginnings like no other. Betting possibilities fresh as the morning dew. This cup of thanks needs no sweetness. These words on the page will resonate for a lifetime. Ah, we chose the chorus of gratitude rather than sing under the truths of the feet. Thank you. This, thank you everyone. So this next poem, is from the God in the human body still, and this is titled Pray. Erase the shadows of yesterday deeper than Emmanuel. Pray it, say it, just one more time. Wipe out the blemish of history, hanging like dark clouds. Pray it, say it, so this won't be a hill to climb. Expand the debris of the past that has left the future in peril. Pray it. Say it so tomorrow will be fine. Thank you. This next one, I know, you know this time, you know, this season, we are all talking about climate change and how, cli how the climate impacts all of us. And this one is titled Flood and Fire. The flood that swept the great oak tree was a vicious storm. Say, Stomnase, why give precious names to these callous winds? The flood that washed away the fig tree was a talking drum. How do we name a barren tree without an axe to grind? The fires that left California in brazen ruins were louder than firecrackers. Why do we earn climate change with a loose tag, ox? The fire that turned the Amazon into a dark shadow was hollow and gray. How do we open the heavens to scar respite from this raging heat? Thank you. This next one is a light hearted poem and is from my chat book. And a chat book titled Voyage and is um, just love poems, and this is titled Caution. I'm, I'm sure poets in the house will resonate with this. Caution. The sign reads, tread with caution, don't date a poet or a typewriter, whether episodes or the brevity of language, poets spill things, and our little secrets could be new screamers. This affection is time-bound, there's an accident locking. This love is on the knife edge. The road of love is slippery. Would you open your eyes and read? Thank you. Oh, Amy, I'm, I'm doing for time. So two more. Okay. So this next one is titled Black and Unique. 
and uh, it's from my collection of poems, Black was not equal and inferior. And I wrote this book, uh, The Mantra to the Black Community, for, for Black voices like me, people who look like me to believe in themselves that being Black does not equal being inferior. If you listen, Black are unique. I wish this can be your favorite poem. This world's ordinances and creed is telling light. I wish you can see the uniqueness of your black skin. Its glory is shining like a dark almond. I wish you can rise above the tides of it and the contraptions of oppression. I wish you can see through the dawning of each day that you are black and unique. I wish you can rise through the squalor of poverty and voices that water color you as underrepresented. I wish you can emblaze your name in gold and swim against every wave of it. I wish you can rise above the labels, false identities stamped on you. You are black and unique. I wish this can be your figure verse. Thank you. Now the final. <laughs> I'm torn between two more, but I will just do one more. <laughs> do two more then. Do two more then. Okay. Oh, thank okay. Oh, thank cool. You. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. So I'll do uh, one for my first ever poetry collection, "The Lions Don't Roar," and this is titled "Heritage." I am from the land where we where we worship different gods before missionaries showed us the one true God. I am from the land where Saturdays are for Oambes and we keep up alive even in our misery. I am from the land of dreams where visionary men took the work of glory, our youth lost after greener pastures and our, and our best brains take flight in mega droves. I am from the land of broken dreams, broken things, broken people and the foul body language. I am from the land where elders are respected and fetted like an iconic symbol on national currency. I am from the land of abundance and want, wealth and poverty, suffering and smiling. This is my heritage, my history and story. Thank you. And the, and the final one is titled My Name, and it's from a collection of poems, The Money Cloud is Empty. And when, after this, I'll, just, I'll leave a link to my Amazon, you know, Amazon page. So if anyone wants to get a copy of any of my books, you are able to just check it out and pick up a copy yourself. So this is titled My Name. My name is an incantation in my grandmother's mouth a deity spitting fire and mysteries. I am the instrument of war and she, but weary. She unwraps my origin like delicate china, appeases my four beers while her tongue was, was, was in ob obeisance. God is worthy of our praise. Todu Walokwe, fated to be a warrior. Akin Yemi, crown of wealth. My name is Fragile Arts a painted art on canvas. I am the poem, and grandmother is a wordsmith, bending me into form. My name is a prayer, unfolding layers of praise. My name is a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Can I have a loud roar like a lion? Roar. 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 <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful set. Thank you so much. This is so brilliant. Thank you for being here. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. Next, we get to see. Is Alexandra here? I don't think so. Um, Jeff Cottrell? Yay, <laughs> Jeff Cottrell. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yay. All right. So um, I'll start with one that I kind of, it's really old and I resurrected it 
last night on another Zoom. It's called A Farewell to Arms, The Lost Chapter. At last, here is a brief excerpt from Ernest Hemingway's classic World War I novel, A Farewell to Arms, that was cut by his editor at the last minute just before publication. This beautiful, heartfelt passage was long lost and forgotten until recently, when it was found among Hemingway's private papers, more than 40 years after the legendary author's death. That's how old this is. It's because it's 60 now. And now, for the first time ever published in print, the immortal prose of A Farewell to Arms, The Lost Chapter. I saw the cafe in the rain. I went inside the cafe, and it was very lovely in the cafe. I sat down at one of the tables and ordered a beer. They brought the beer to me, and I drank it, and it was very nice and very fine, so I ordered another one. Then they brought me some pretzels, and I began to eat them, and they were very salty. So I ate the pretzels, which made the beer seem salty, and they were good. And I read the newspaper while I sat and drank another beer and ate the pretzels, and the news in the paper, where was I? And the news in the paper was very interesting, and the grappa was very tasteful, too. And I had a dish of ham and eggs in which the eggs were placed on top of the ham, and it tasted well. And the dish was about the size of your hand, and the war was going on in the mountains. And I drank another beer with the eggs, which were good, and the salty flavor of the pretzels made my mouth water, and I was hungry. And there was a group of musicians in the cafe singing, and their voices were very beautiful in the rain and there was news about the war in the newspaper which was in english but the writing was good and it was pleasant and warm in the cafe and everything was nice and i drank another beer and the beer was good and the ham and eggs were good and the grappa was good and the newspaper was good and the cafe was good and everything was all nice and good and made you feel fine but the cafe felt lonesome i saw catherine come in I thought she was very lovely. I wanted to kiss her, and I did. Oh, darling, she said, you are here. Hello, I said, I am glad to see you. It makes me glad to see you again. Oh, darling, she said, I do not like the rain. The rain is not good, I said. I do not like the rain. Let us go away from the rain, please, darling. Yes, we will go away. Let us go to Spain, for it is very nice. I love you and will go to Spain with you. I hear it is nice and there are bullfights. Come to bed with me, I said. I loved her and the beer was good. I do not like the rain, not even in Spain. But there is not much rain in Spain, darling. I do not like the rain in Spain. I do not even like it on the plain. We laughed together and felt very amused. Now you must come to bed with me, I said, drinking a cup of wine. Yes, darling, I will come to your bed because I am happy. Then we will go to Spain and watch bullfights. I do not like the rain, but you make me happy, and I love you, and you make me love me, and that makes me happy. Oh, I am so happy. You make me happy, darling. Are you happy? What can I do to make you happy? Do you want to play with my hair? Do you want to drink a beer? Yes. We sat in the cafe and I had another glass of beer. The beer was well brewed and it made the room whirl around you and you were whirling with the room and it was all you could do as the war raged on on the outside. But still it was Catherine and she was beautiful and I liked how she wore the necklace as I felt the taste of the beer on the sides of my tongue and did not care about the war so that we would go to bed. But there was always the rain which was not liked by Catherine. That was just not good. That was A Farewell to Arms, The Lost Chapter. I published that in a chapbook uh, many, many years ago, and the chapbook got a terrible review, but the, the, the reviewer completely missed the point of that. Thought it was, didn't realize it was a parody, just thought it was me pretentiously trying to emulate Hemingway. Wow, which means I did too good a job, I think. Um, if I have time for another one, I guess I'll do this one. Um, I'm sure you've heard it before. It's called Meeting. Afternoon, stakeholders. I'd like to take ownership of this meeting and utilize it to reach out to all of you on the team and touch base in a proactive way. 
going forward, before we hit the ground running in regards to our action item list, does anybody here have an ask? Any of you have an ask? Nobody has an ask? No ask? Well, let's use our bandwidth wisely and get on with our thought shower. For our primary action item going forward, let's consider reprioritizing our delivery strategy in regards to our best practices and our learnings. Do our best practices add value to the team? Do they result in value added? What kind of impact do they have? How does it impact you as a team member? How do you impact the team? How do you impact the bottom line? Do you do it in an impactful way? Is this done impactfully? Is this a cutting edge impact compliant with our externalities or does this impact result in a negative growth? Does this impact minimize the usage of bandwidth or is it a wastage of metrics? Is it appropriate to think outside the box here or would it be better to look for the low hanging fruit by leveraging a standard operating procedure with a high quality solution? In regards to this action item, does anybody have an ask? Any ask, no asks yet? Fine. Let's progress the situation by doing a 360 and layering the message with alignments and blue sky thinking. In regards to our new SOP, we are forced to deal with a severe and challenging opportunity. How can we solution this opportunity? How can we action this opportunity? If we take the ball and run with it and be intentional with this opportunity, how will this impact our deliverables? After we leverage the SOP and weaponize it and then slaughter the firstborn children of our competitors, should we task our scrutineers to redact the usage of our externalities with a full hard stop? Oh, somebody has an ask. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. No, no, we are not going to be slaughtering any children. That was a metaphor. Now then, in regards to our secondary objectives and our mission statement, let's unpack this and liaise with our negative growth going forward. To put a pin in that, how much bandwidth should we expend by tasking the deliverables to the external stakeholders, and will that result in force, cre force creep? How can we solution this impact in the third quarter with a focus on state-of-the-art technologies? Should we detonate the bomb in the hospital's underground parking garage? And if so, should we take it offline? Will this cause a predetermined hard stop in the office? Somebody has an ask. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, we are not planning to detonate any explosives anywhere. That was jargon. Well, it's the new jargon. Have another donut there. Now. In regards to our limited bandwidth and proactive fiscal years, let's put all this in our wheelhouse and webinize the essentials. Will we need to resource action the whole department? And if not, will there be an excess of wastage? Can we make productive usage of this wastage? Is it an opportunity we can solution with minimal wastage? Should we leverage a solution from the remote team going forward? And whom do we task with this solution? What impact will it have? How will it impact the subsequent impact? Is this a game-changing impact? Will this impact change the landscape of the industry? Once we've succeeded in our world domination objective, how much of the global population should we enslave? Do we enslave them through brute force or through brainwashing and manipulation? Should their deaths be quick and painless or do we resort to torture first? How cruel do we need to be? Should our cruelty have a practical objective or should we torture the populace for the pure enjoyment of it? How long do we wait before wiping out the dolphins? What about the harp seals? Should we use clubs, tasers, or power drills? What time frame should we establish for firing a nuclear missile at the sun? And when we do, what kind of impact will it have on our impacts? Yes, we have another ask. Mm-hmm. 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 Well, I think this team member's asks are having a negative impact on our bottom line. I vote that we solution this team member permanently. I propose that we make a strong impact on him. Specifically, we impact him on the side of his head with a crowbar, and then we adopt a new delivery strategy by delivering him through a 10th floor window. Mm -hmm. No, it's not a metaphor. Let's make kicking his ass our primary action item going forward with great impact. Impactfully. Thank you. That was for all of you who work in offices. That was called meeting. Thank you. I was laughing and laughing and laughing tears. So brilliant. I appreciate it.
I worked in a job like that where she was constantly raising the bar and talking about self-awareness and all these things. It was just impossible to please her. So I totally get that. <laughs> okay, Richard Harries. Hello, um, I've got a content warning. Um, and uh, it's a poem I wrote in the middle of the night last night because I, I have broken sleep patterns. I've been thinking this through for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I do find this a safe place to bring these things to, but it does mention mental health problems. And it's called Discovering Myself. My life has had turbulence. I have not always coped. In fact, three breakdowns, four breakdowns. Diagnosed clinical depression, two full years off work. One year, unable to leave the house, largely in bed. Psychotherapy, cathartic, helpful. A man who really should not have been a father as my dad. A woman, a mother who died of cancer at 50 when I was 13. A sexual predator, paedophile as a stepmother. All caused damage, terrible damage. A sister with ADD, attention deficit disorder. That sister dying violently at 49. All these things called harm. Panic attacks over things, cancelled holidays, being dealt with unfairly, a situation at work causing the worst breakdown. Attacks and slights taken vastly hard. Things I knew in my brain should not affect me, but did. Haunted me for weeks. Then a discovery that I was, due to my early life, bipolar, with excessive highs and lows in my reactions to life and the crap it throws, and that I also had RSD, rejection dysphoria syn syndrome, unable to regulate reaction to rejection, a moment of startling self-evaluation, a huge understanding of myself, a calming to an extent, I know why there has been so much pain. I know I must try, try very hard to avoid, avoid crisis, confrontation, toxic, venomous people, remove myself from noxious situations. I feel this knowledge is a great step forward. I finally discover myself. I can now move on, understand me and be me whole. Um, and uh, it's been get, get, DK DK uh, has suggested this uh, a topic to me, and um, he's an amazing poet. And I've been gestating it, you know, for about ten days. <laughs> so when I couldn't sleep in the middle of the night, I thought I'm going to do something productive instead of just being angry that I'm not asleep. Um, and um, to change the mood completely, I'm going to do a more humorous one, and you don't need any contact warnings for this. And it's called Her Love Just Grows. Now, we have been married for 50 years, and the love and affection and, well, yes, respect she shows me is touching indeed. In recent years, her appreciation and adoration of me just grows. She no longer calls me love or darling. But yes, wait for it. God. Yes, God. A beloved, revered and powerful deity, she often almost shrieks with great emotion. Oh, my God! While staring wildly at me. Yes, I am her beloved God, or just a simple, affectionate, but powerfully expressed, my God! I'm always moved and touched, but if in public where others can hear it, I'm embarrassed. But then things got even better. I felt more cherished. She started shouting, shouting with some passion, ye gods! So it seems I'm like more than one deity. How very sweet and truly devoted and admiring is she. Um, <laughs> she, she does keep shouting that at me. <laughs> but there you go. Um, and then finally, um, th this actually was um, another challenge by DKDK. Um, and it's... It, asked me why and how I started writing poetry. Now, I don't know if I've done it before here, but I may have done. It's not very old, but um, it's called The Happening. I never decided to write poetry. 
kind of happened. I never decided to perform, kind of happened. I stood on the stage, I did my first piece. The love and reaction flowed, I was moved. The adrenaline flooded out, it had happened. I can only write to express emotion, it happens. When it's about sadness, anger, rage, depression and desolation, that's when I am happening at my best. The chemistry happens. Those poems decide to come themselves, it happens. So why do I write poetry, I ask? Mainly a release of emotion. So it's happening. Catharsis, such a blessed release, saves my sanity, maybe my life. It's happened. And that's me for today. Thank you. Um, I've been quite writing quite a lot. I, I have periods where I don't write and then the ideas and the emotions kick in and it is about emotion. I can't just decide to sit down, you know. Um, um, and then I find myself writing lots sometimes, you know. Yes, very It odd. comes and goes. Mine does too. It'll, I'll write yeah. a lot for a month and then like not write at all and then write a lot. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your personal stories and your emotions. Just beautiful. And I love that your wife goes, oh my God. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, she, she said it so many times, I thought it has to be a poet. You know? uh, but I do have to uh, shriek it down. So, yes. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Now we have Ike Waltz. My life in your shadow. But can you outrun your shadow? We are all dressed inside a shadow. Eisenstein exploited its images. There never became a fashion. Cattle, even permanently attached, are never legally purchased and judged. Shadow lives their own lives and tell their own parallel tale, he said. And Shadow replied, whichever way I turn, I am like that flat. I am kind of black that kind of a shade of black without a shadow of a doubt. Neither a shady deal, only flat, just like that. Neither long nor short, I am or almost always in a stretch on the floor, the wall, and when I pee, my reflection I see. I read and see bold words, flat and black, like a shadow on paper thin, yet books on sight. I can open my mouth, but I cannot speak with sound. I have no name, not even Jack, John, Rick, or Dick. I always see you and me in a way others can't ever be. I am bursting with secrets I cannot reveal. I dance dangerously at night by my cozy flickering fireside, never been seen in a dream, neither red, blue, or green. But why only black? Ask my cat, and I am mute as only I can be. I am a creation stretching imagination in all directions of the bizarre. Do you follow me? I can tell I am what I am, flatter than flat, beyond thinner than thin. Try to step on me, I feel no pain. Try to love me, I'm lost of words. Try to hate me, I'm life, all right. And you are always so loyal, attached to any one of my many sides. I hold you your driver, but I don't screw you. I try to reach my abundant soul. Try and we will quiver, remember that strange light. Will the shadow of my life blanket me when I die? In real time, I predict your every movement. I'm always there, attached as a flat, never laid, shading of flat. No questions asked, no hot, no icy cold. My flat has no goal, no feel, no function. Should we meet another, you and I? Should our destination ever cross? Questions never arise, and the shadow box in the light 
we call twi twilight it is yet always remaining one against none that's flat commingle overlap changing density values without compromising thickness like i already said magic just like that status static versus dynamic even when we are crossing us dating never enters us i make sure that we are shadow chatting in languages up to the edge of assassination but don't succeed as yours too carries carries the defenseless in me let it blow circles in celestial winds let it snow and rain in dimensions other than square sun and moon may shine you are always there smoky clouds may intertwine you appear on the other side of light i follow any color not only black a kind of a shady black hooded i painted you just like that after all you had a free ride to the moon you don't fought you are only the silent part attached to my installation of conceptual art where the concept is my embedded dynamic that momentary ego i got on whichever way time turns me on turns on me off who i am our shadow so always mine a shade never unglued that kind of black remains forever being flat the world can judge a shadow a shadow has no religion never questions the length of time time is not based on poor riches but lectures historical strategy like shady decisions in war and peace shadows never take you to war but follows you so willingly bravery loyalty is guns in awe and when it shows up red blood is a photo black and black so black is never what's blood shadows incapable to fight eternal light and you love and hate race gender and age of late equally used to the lifelong attachment call it body with mate attention shadow is all the same but then i'm only flat and with my taste last breath i mixture within that cosmic shadow neither rich black nor deep black or shade of gray be it was it may when history dies the hypocrisy lies and final eternal darkness is bitterness demise but always always with that naked constant what is remaining that unexplainable why is the universe soaked in hundred percent blackness is this all we are allowed to see yes the sun is free to see what she wants to see however if black and novelty forever so kind is at stake it's earthen view it's science day just imagine imagine for only one human day shadow is on strike imagine nothing remains we call black what would we say what would we see what would happen on such a day it seems my black shadow my black night my universe my galaxy are as white as equally black but both are not of color yet for every shade you pay a dollar and then how many shadows have shades per se how many shadows rather than only two have multiple multiple dimensions there i asked truly you shadow never polluted or polluting not yet taxed can't be split with an axe never in pain always reflects with you side by side step by step without complaint yes there is a shadow hidden inside me waiting to be born into light when darkness governs waiting to be released from my eyes any day we would be so discombobulated if infinity would be measured that unmeasurable equal thickness when shadows start and end to be the mysterious infinite dimension the topological space of subjects that galactic flood creation of our shadow in black or is it the black holy whole really denser than black 
Is the black hole really denser than black? Once I kissed you for the last time, our shadow so speechless walked away, had nothing any more to say, as you kept distancing free speech forever without shadow. Anyway, finally, you are my blanket, my calming lullaby, my forever faded to my bed into a shadow's silent good night. My last dream switched off the light. My shadow turned from darkness into that roaring sound of snore. And my lovely wife knows how to wipe the shadows of our yesterday's worries away. Called life. Good night, my shadow, she says. Good night. Brothers and sisters, never is a shadow of a doubt we should take for granted. And shadow is never a surprise, a shadow is always mine. As long as I can see, shadow can see me too. The IRS can't charge, not yet, but just one more dimension. What will the future bring? Thank you. That was wonderful. Such an exploration of the shadow metaphor. Just every bit of it you explored and i was writing in the chat it's like the quantum physics of shadows because <laughs> it was extraterrestrial as well <laughs> thank you so much ike now we have laura gravel who is our feature next month thank you amy wonderful Wonderful poetry, absolutely stunning. All, all the start here, all the people, and a beautiful, beautiful feature. I love the roaring Tolu. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to start with the lack. The lack of respect is exhausting. The blood we can wipe away, but the lack, the lack threatens to crack everything we own everything we do not. Why do you see those men over there with the ladder and the climbing equipment? They're dripping glue into that enormous tear where earth threatens to split in two. Trouble is when the tear breaks through earth's crust, the glue will not be enough. The molten heart will come pouring out. By the time it cools, we will be in another ice age. There will be no turning back. Thank you. And the second piece, second and last piece I'm gonna do, um, is called Parking Lot Heat. It is set in Austria. It does have some mention of war, so. <clears throat> Nothing terribly graphic, but I need to say that. As we leave the parking lot heat behind us and Dr. Acupuncture begins a holiday in Salzkammergut, as the Thai market with its kitchen spoils an assortment of patrons and the Jewish farm has lost its street sign, France serves herbal schnapps in his inner courtyard, and the birds swarm high in Mühlviertel. As the dragon of a chancellor drinks Russian punch, and the temperature in Linz climbs the high rises, as helicopters scratch the tummies of pig clouds, and families trudge north towards barbed wire. As 400 kilometers to the east, the Ukraine burns and resists. Buildings screech, wheat fields sweat, and sunflowers tremble. As here up high, the beetle-eaten trees decry 
with Mr. Sunshine and Sister Moon, the decay of rind, and ponder the composting of love and grief, the resurrection of forest leaf. As we leave the parking lot heat behind us, and it is too hot to shuffle around without a hat, we here up high in Mulefirtle on steep green slopes will find love. As the stone plants smile and the ravens call, as a mushroom stutters his cordial hem, as the earth sighs its summer breath, we will rest here in this garden and simply love. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh, such stark metaphors. And I would say magic realism in a way where you're, the, you're stretching the metaphor to describe a current situation. Just beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now we have Finn Bell. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Amy, and uh, thank you to Lou for your um, your incredibly moving feature. Thank you. Um, so two poems today. Uh, apologies for my voice; I'm still recovering um, from being sick. So the first um, poem is titled "Neath the Tree of Good and Evil." Can my voice speak up for the serpent crushed beneath the steel toe booted sky? Can it hiss polysyllabic in a first mother's voice? It gets lost on its belly, winding, toiling, tilling itself. New turn pungent black soil lodges slow dawning realization between its silver edge blade. A single stalk of grass, a weapon to seize and melt down. It finds the apples ready ripe, the tree easy to climb, the temptation and entrapment preordained. Fifth day accord, sixth day lie. A concept of God and a mortal in his image sizzle pork belly and innards dominion. Conceive the rending of sacred flesh from bone. Discuss at great length how a sausage is made. A room appears in the pastoral History is the word carved in stone by lightning striking once in the wrong valley. Is this the room where it happened? The prophet asks of the wilderness, his own voice echoing back, founding fathers chopping down unsuspecting cherry trees had nothing on negotiating a deception. A voice is a serpent, is a tree, is its fruit, is a woman path through paradise diverted under an upturned shot glass heaven, silence. God rested on the seventh day. Okay, the second one um, is uh, simply titled Blue. Um, and it is uh, inspired by uh, Karen Coe's um, art piece called Fragments One. Uh, 2018. Uh, Karen Ko is a British Malaysian artist, and uh, she speaks a lot about her um, her her migrant experience or her family's migrant experience. Uh, touched me very much. It, it very much mirrors um, a lot of, of my life. So this is dedicated to my mother. Um, the um, the art, the art piece uh, reminded me of of the dusters, um, which my my mom would wear, which are kind of uh, what the women in the country uh, countryside in the Philippines would wear. It's it's a loose but but beautifully colored dress with kind of uh, uh, sleeveless. It's 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 like a sundress but but loose. Um, so if you want to look it up, it's called the duster. Um, so this is called blue. 
if my mother's country girl dusters wore their homesickness on the outside, they would die and stain her body blue, seep into her bloodstream, see her now, a bird-boned golden brown woman, heart pumping indigo through veins and out arteries, each passing a purging, a dilution, a cleansing of history. They would seep out life force fluid and flood the kitchen floor, a further shedding of abandoned homeland, an amalgamation of colonized milk pre-introduced, remixed, parts uneven, measure. What is yours is mine, folded in with each stir, each stab. What is ours was never meant for you, for your kind. You see, a mixture is never equal parts, or it is invention, ingenuity, adaptation, accosting, appropriating, claiming, conquering. If my mother had worn her country girl dusters on the outside, stepped outside, sashaying the stars and rays caught in her hem, weaved them, waved them like wings of a cooped up dove heart stirring, Kumikinang na bandera ng bayan minamahal. Bluefield aloft, buoyed for a moment in the shifting air of land of the free and the brave, what then would follow? A bird clad in sky, spangled star bursting stratosphere may still be led astray blinded, following the birth and death of a cruel father son. Thank you. Oh my, oh my, that was so amazing. Every word, everything, <laughs> so good. Thank you so much. Just metaphor within metaphor within. Just wonderful. Thank you. And now we have Suzanne West. Thank you. What a powerful. <laughs> It's day here, whatever, wherever you are. Very, very beautiful to see today. Um, I'm going to start with this one. Um, part of me wants to just uh, get it out of the way. So there's content warning here about suicide. This is for you, Scott. He is the sea. My dear, dear, life broken, heart broken, gentle brother came home to jump off the famous bridge where so many others found an end to this round of, for them, impossibilities. I honor them all and do not believe Bad karma awaits them. <clears throat> I know my brother became the sea, may return here in one form or another to offer his love to others who are considering. And then I have one other called, what are your words? What words seep deep into your skull? Calm the thought storms, show the boulders the way out, and sky the way in. What are your words that cast spells? Summon the song of the stone who wants to love you. What words can unearth your buried pain? to speak it all. What words are dense, tense, untouchable, scare others away, even the bats and scorpions? What words aren't yours are the inheritance from your wounded lineage? What words are locked in a bleak, grimy dungeon? deeply sobbing their hopelessness, dying to be heard. 
What words thrill your wild won't let you rest until you howl, until you claim your fur and tail? What words paint the true shape of you when you're broken? And what are your words when you are one with all that is? What words spoken bless others' pain? Soft stitch the gashes, kiss awake the dormant shine, offer a portal. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Wonderful elegy for your brother. And the second one was so clever and spiritual. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Oh, you're welcome. Angie Williams. Hello, everybody. Um, Hello. Hang on, let me see this. Okay. Um, with all the little craziness that's going on with our um, politics today, in our country, I decided to write this. It's called Felons Have No Voice. They brand us felons for any offense. We lose our right to vote. We lose our voice. Yet in the house that marble with power, being a felon has a voice. Being a felon can run the land, yet felons have no voice. Past mistakes take our power. Past mistakes take our rights. Past mistakes takes our second chance away. Past mistakes take our voice. For the powers that be, past mistakes takes no freedom from them. Past mistakes a felon may be, but the hall, uh, halls of, pres of the presidency loom high. Felons have no voice. Without a, a voice, there is no power. Without a voice, we are invisible. How can a felon be president, but felons can't vote? A felon can be president locked up, but felons locked up can't vote. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. No power, no voice is an injustice anywhere and everywhere. Thank you. Angie, I appreciate you bringing that all to the forefront. It is so wild that, I mean, beyond wild, it's, it's just insane that felons are running for president or that a felon's running for president and that so many other people have lost their voice, as you said. It's a very, very stark difference. And, Racist. And according, according to the, the, the Constitution, there are only three things that, that can keep you, you know, that you have to have. And they've already started preparing the penitentiary in case uh, Trump has to go mm -hmm. for him to be president from the penitentiary. <laughs> that kind of made me write that. I'm so glad you did. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is Tyrone Stokes here? I do not see. Clive Oseman. Is he still here? I believe mine. Okay. I don't see him now. Yeah. Okay. Richard Spizak. Thank you so very much, my friend. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, honored to be able to share a couple pieces with you all. Uh, this first piece is, um, I don't know if you've heard, but uh, there are people who uh, who say there's global warming. And uh, this is my little my little tribute to, to those poor souls who are convinced that something's going on. It's called Thank the Gods. Thank the gods for air conditioning. It forgives and ameliorates my awful geo-positioning. I need not worry about the heat, nor scurry when my sweaty feet refuse to rest in clothed in shoes. What we do without it, heaven, train, and carrier only knows. A refrigeration lets me refine the chill enclosure where I keep my wine, and the freezer where I store my lunch. 
so that in August my salad still goes crunch, and all the merry music of the glass in my of the ice in my glasses, all those hot and sultry days my ancient family tree surpasses, allows my Coca-Cola stew to bubble and sizzle like you know who. The frames and confines my salad and coal cut so spicy fine, preserves in my food each plastic container. Sure, it sheds little old microscopic plastic taters and taints my bloodstream while it does its work. Does that make me a soda jerk? Uh, but when the Texas grid collapses, what you gonna do? How slow at 120 degrees Fahrenheit the slow time passes without a clink of ice in your glasses. No regulation slaps their wrist, and who's exactly to blame for this? No Democrat near to give big business pause. Lordy, lordy, we chum in those greedy jaws. So when, in deregulation, the grid collapses, trust me, won't be no icebergs clinking in your glasses. So when, in deregulation, no air conditioning to light the neighborhood, won't be doing no televisioning, maybe the darkness will do us good. And all those silicone trinkets that surround might as well be paving stones. No, 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 not a single jingle sound. And the climate-aware old weatherman will be finally silent, no more complaining, while in the TV studio silent stands whether or not it's raining. No more complaining about climate change while the deck chairs on the Titanic subtly, even imperceptibly, get rearranged. That's not by scientists. And this, and this, for your amusement, those of you who attend to a garden or two, I'm going to share a screen and show you a bit of a graphic poem for your amusement, I hope. Oops. No share screen yet. Yep, not yet. Should I give it another try or are we going to pass on that? Yeah. No, not yet. Okay, well, I'll just read the poem then. All right, this is, uh, <laughs> this is uh, called The Avuncular Aphid. And for those of you who, who uh, are curious about what avuncular is, I had to look it up myself. The term just came to me as a po poem title. Avuncular means sort of like a benevolent uncle. And you'll find how absolutely inappropriate it is to apply to an aphid. Aphids are primarily from the northern temperate zone. That's where exactly you'll typically find them at home. The little suckers lead an interesting life, but never ever husbands and never ever wives. Although only a few species are serious pests, few bother to know that, and well, you can guess the rest. Their bodies are pear-shaped, and you know how that goes. They're cute little heads, and they're massive down belows, all suspended, of course, on six spindly legs. And they own two exhaust pipes, and on this I won't hedge. They've got two exhaust pipes aimed up on high called cornicles, but you know what? I just found out why. These exude a defensive fluid called cornical wax. And it's used in defense, and that's the very pungent facts. Many species are green. Others are white, yellow, red, pink, brown, black, or mottled. But this doesn't tell all. After that, I must admit, I've been throttled. Some types, some species have two color types, a red and a green. I would tell you more, but that's all I've seen. And when we talk about reproduction, you'll see what I mean. How easily they do it is downright obscene. They have sucking marth parts, feed exclusively on sap, aphids fit on stems, leaves, even roots, and now you know that to, to boot. They reproduce rapidly in forming colonies or clumps, but if you're hoping they had a rich sex life, a rich, such rich sex life, this may drop you in the dumps. Parthenogenic reproduction is their thing. They don't need a partner to go have a fling. Right off the bat, they go birthing their young without any partner. See how it's done? The female aphid reproduces for a period of 20 to 30 days, such are their uses, giving birth to from 60 to 100 live nymphs. With so many live births, no wonder they're blown up like blimps. The nymphs quickly mature and can produce within a week. No wasting time for dating, that's not what they see. Eggs within these females develop long before birth. No wonder their babies don't cover the earth. A newly born aphid can contain within herself not only the developing embryos of her daughters, as if that wasn't enough, but also those of her granddaughters all ready to puff. Aphids can build up populations quite fast. One aphid could produce billions of offsprings. Thank God they don't last. <laughs> Gone by the end of the season. And to accomplish all that, they know they have a heck of a reason to suture 
the future. Thank you so much. So clever as always. Wonderful work. Thank you. Wait, I think I got lost here. Oh, now, Deirdre Hines. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, and lovely to be here for the first time. Wonderful feature. I'm blown away by Beyond the New as well earlier in particular. I'm just going to read you a little bit from my book, just a little, because it's a novella, just a little section to begin with. Forget everything you think you know or thought you knew about how to get from A to B, from 1 to 20, or from start of story to final page. Begin again in that place your heart knew as real, before mind shut out imagination. Back when you mistook her rumblings for indigestion or constipation. Before logicals strapped on spectacles and your sight went into hiding, along with treasure maps, fairy egg cup silver, gnome homes in dapple sycamore shade, and all denizens of once upon a truth. You cannot get there by plane, car or boat. It cannot be seen with Google Maps. It's easier if you're small or even if you're very, very tall. All you need to find your way back to where every story that you forgot calls home is to listen not just with your ears, but with the whole of all your brilliant beat. Lose your logicals, open the gate apart, journey back on slatch of song, forgotten rhyme of billowing surf, spread of starlight on sparkling strand to the mermelves in the cove of Mer Bay. If by happy chance you were to see a mermelf looking up at you from deep within some seawater or shaded nook, you'd see yourself reflected in eyes that shift and change colour depending on time of year or remembered moment, like when they grew their first set of wings or when their firmest, famous fur took on the hue of the ancient wisdom bears of time. Perhaps their laugh would tickle your funny bone too, or you'd join them in a dig for mermelves or builders of renown, not just on land, but also on sea beds. Sometimes a mermelf may look at first like a moving rainbow. This is because they like to decorate their fur with flowers, shells or borrowed items from Flotsam or her cousin Jetsam. It is even said they once found the maps that drew the way to El Dorado, Atlantis, Lioness, but lost them to an air balloon. Stories of them climbing up and into magpie nests or hunting after dwarven hordes are true. Mermelves love shiny jingles, perhaps because their hair is wisdom bear brown, although there are rumours of wisdom bears blue. Until they reach the age of magical seven, plus or minus two, all mermelves can understand everything that is or will or was. Like all and every child that ever is or will or was, they know wisdom for who she truly is behind the mask of learn this off by heart instead of live life, Ask why, follow paths of hearts. To remember those who rathered reasoning, the merriam of colossal mistakes has pictures in its archives of schools so that history does not repeat errors made by lies on the earth plane. So what do Marmel children do instead of homework, tests and timetables? Simple, to start they choose the passion of their heart. For most it is swimming with the merl where they hear deep water lore from Leviathan. For some, it is climbing with the elves, where they sing leaf and bud to greenwood. For few and far between, it is digging down into the sand or loam or shale to chart new pathways between the worlds with maybe Badgerina, Fennec Fox, River Otter, Dorian Pika, Mole Ant or favourite Mermelf Auntie. When is a mermelf not a mermelf? For one in a million adventure calls. One such is true subject of this telling. Her name was Shu. She came to Merbay, a striped firefly, all on her own. 
When portals between the worlds began to close, chaos rose. Each Mermel clan chose either a hidden life or a free one. If Mermels do not decorate themselves, their fur can blend into the earth. But Chu was born a brilliant blue. No place to hide except in lagoon or pool or sea. At seven, Mermels grow elven wings or mermaid tail. But Chu had neither of either. And what was more, she was long past seven. So just give you a little, a little thing. That Thank is you. so Thank delightful. You. So delightful. What a joy for children to read or be read to. That is just wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Ronald Bremner. Hi, all. Hi there. See what we see what we've got here. Oh, what do we have here? Uh, just one minute. Okay. I wandered lonely as a. Uh, I'm having a problem right now, so uh, maybe you can come back to me. That would be fine. Thank you. Mona Zamfirescu. Thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple of poems, a lighter one and um, and, and a different kind. <laughs> I'm going to start with a lighter one. Um, summer. Linden blossoms on old newspapers, drying the promise of a future tea. The black ink still wet with the rains of spring. The stories diffused, not news anymore, just words, unspoken, undone, unloved. In the kitchen, under mountains of sugar, sweet peaches boil the summer away, promised for a future time, for winters were barren and harsh back in the day. We stole the summer with ripe cherries, my grandfather's tree laden over the neighbor's yard, heavy with red glory. I'd reach my hands beyond the fence, a scrawny kid along the rough bark. I cherished that harsh embrace. No tomorrows on the heavy branches, just me sharing the boon. My little brother below, doubtful, his smile still dripping, red cherries, and us, kids. The days passed us, the days passed. Linden trees still line the streets of our town. Years gone by, years gone. The summers always promised away. And for the second poem, I want to say that um, I wrote it on the prompt of movies, but just something about me, maybe you don't know, I don't watch TV, I don't go to the movie, I, I, kind of, I actually don't even remember much of the movies that I've seen. So what I thought of doing was to like take the top 100 movies of all time or something like that, the titles, and make a poem out of the title. So each line in this poem is the title of a movie. Okay. And I kind of sort of put them together to make a story, to make up a story. Um, okay, so here it goes. Movies. The City of Lights, a clockwork orange. American graffiti proclaiming not all quiet on the Western Front. The sound of music gone with the wind, the best years of our lives running the green mile, the gra grapes of wrath, the silence of lambs, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the wild bunch in the jaws, lost in the jaws of 12 angry men, good fellas. It happened one night, the Shawshank Redemption, 
a lonely place, the city of God. Life is beautiful on the Sunset Boulevard, the lives of others. From the rear window of a streetcar named Desire, a dark night, the vagabond tells of the great escape. Wild tales. Twelve years a slave, a matter of life and death, this requiem for a dream. Modern times, north by northwest, on the waterfront, one flew over a cuckoo's nest. A rebel without the cause, the midnight cowboy, the easy rider, the unforgiven in the golden rush from here to eternity, dances with the wolves. <clears throat> Once upon a time in America, the children of heaven, don't look now, now only angels have wings. Out of the past rush, greed, the wings of desire. For a few dollars more, the green velvet, the matrix, the last laugh, crash before sunset. La dolce vita, la grande illusion, apocalypse now. Thank you. Oh, Mona, that was so good. The first one was so beautiful, so beautiful. And the second was, as Finn said, so wonderfully woven together. And to me, like an, a, a picture of this unequal world with it. <laughs> it's all the ways that Hollywood puts it out there, but the way you wove it kind of made it real about reality. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Is Neil Daswani here? I don't think he's. No. Joanne wore a big James. Let's see. Mm. Jeffrey Bryant. <laughs> Welcome. Hi, thank you so much. Mona, for somebody who does not watch movies, that was an absolute masterpiece. I have to tell you, start to finish. I, I, I'd I love to have a copy of that because I'm a cinephile and that is genius. It was absolute genius. So many good poems today. Thank you so much. The first one I'm gonna do is called Running Too Fast Around the Pool. I am still the child reaching for the lifeguard. Another day of running too fast around the pool. I cannot swim like this, floating at gunpoint, fitting in at a finger snap, slipping into a white uniform, handed a mortarboard destiny, a life of keeping paths cleared for this week's billionaire. I'm sorry, hold on. Surrender masked as wisdom. I am a muscled accident, a queer atomic whirlwind, hopscotching sunrise to sunrise, the taboo, my true north. I am lost, foolish, sloppy with my days, but I live them in urban gender swirls as no one else's ambition. I still run around pools, chasing you, lapping off the lifeguard and the diving board, catching you in a chlorine kiss, floating free from the crosshairs of the world and out to sea on fu our future on waters that keep rising and rinsing us all out of Earth's hair. Second poem. What the dead believe. Who knows what the dead believe? Is that what we said all goffed up our coffee shop refills, lighting up again and again? Are the dead really up there looking down on us? Why be obsessed with the living once you're bodiless? We took long futureless drags on our cigarettes, our eyes locked love gripping our balls, forgetting all the punk poetry full of 
cartoon meaninglessness. Now I have a marker with an epitaph Homeric in length and a ghost-written glossary of fatal flaws. On the little nearby bench you sit talking, lighting up because I won't judge you. And you'll know I'm listening when something that bites lands on the space my fingers used to circle around your neck. Fingers now all bony and totally cool ghoul. You exhale smoke and smile, teeth marked with layers of wisdom. I'd laugh at cemetery business hours too, and the fact that you have to leave me be and come again tomorrow with fresh stolen flowers and a list of questions only I can answer. You light up, sit back, as my whispers knit a shawl to warm you, and I tell you finally what the dead believe. Thank you. Oh, wow. Wow, both of those. So excellent. So Thank wonderful. You. Thank you. Wonderful work. Just wonderful. Thank you. Eddie Foreman? No, let's see. Ed Poetastic. Because my name is fantastic. Thank you so much. Yes, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ed Potasso, Fantastic. Fantastic. Please don't tell me you could join my Ryan Bottle Supply. I got two pieces, so I won't take too much time. My first piece is called The Hope of Freedom. Let freedom ring while Lady Liberty sing. Let it spread like water, drawing out the marauders, cleaning out the corruption, the power of clean productions, melting away the violence in order to sprout nonviolence. Soaking, soaking up all the crazy firearms, no more chaos to do harm, to wither away our constitution in order to think of grounded solutions, to feed the mouths of the slaves, growing seeds of supportive engrave, drifting us in another direction, an ocean of collection and reflection. Yes, please plant the tight seed, the seed of positivity and humanity. Let freedom ring, hope will sprout. Let injustice be mute, evil will drought. Hope is inside you, her, him, and we. Don't stop creating a liberating sea. Thank you. Here's my last one. This is called Page Not Found. I saved it last night. Computer, you want to fight? I saved it on the document. Then I click attach and send. I don't want to write it again. The words needed to end. I was brainstorming like mad. Quotes and opinions I add. My fingers dancing on a keyboard. Very easy than writing on a chalkboard. Now I have to start over again. Where's my papers and pen? Why didn't I take accurate notes? My ideas do swim and float. No, I believe, no, 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 I think. Damn, my thesis starts to shrink. Oh, I'm not a fan of stress. I can feel the punches in my chest. Breathe in and out. Be calm, don't shout. I have time, no need to pout. It should be about technology. Sorry, computer, no apologies. Why is it backwards and flawed? Hope it won't come out odd. My essays print on paper. Hope it won't disappear into vapor. Sometimes tech is a godsend, but it's not. It makes our plans and minds full of knots. Technology can confuse our simple tasks. What task? Do I really, do I really need to ask? I'm finally done. That was fun. Time always seems to run. Wait, my previous essay was saved, but accidentally sent it to Dave. Technology. Look what you made me do. Now I'm a buffoon split in two. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. I love your rhyme schemes. They're so clever and fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you for being such a fun and a wonderful son. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Raymond Moses. Naima. Josh Raw. Okay. Leslie Constable. Hello, everyone. Really wonderful to be here. Um, 
Okay, I am going to read uh, two. This first one is called Dreamland, These Energies. You are part of this place, belonging to it. It is not part of you. It claims you. The world is there, and rivers are there, rivers. These, the veins of earth, the water of life, blood supplying, fertilizing the plain. The world is fast, and there are rivers to feed these places where life grows, and us to eat the substance of all that roots, nourished by the water, the blood of earth, and grows. The world is fast and slow, slow than fast. There are the rivers. I promise the portions of the sky that I know that I own and will tell you about. There will not be the silence of stars, but the voice of oblivion speaking through me in whispers. I know I will not keep their secret. Their secret is mine to own, to shout to others, or to nestle with deep into me, dear to me, in the flesh that I am as mammalian and nuzzle and nuzzle the shout forming inside to scream the ineffable, the wordless state, the wordless mind, a star above the moon. The Id idiocy of thought, the fruitless endeavor to think we are when we are both are and are not are, yet also only simply we, plural, amplified, being only in the grace of love, the radiating light traveling the ands and moments and movement, traveling always through and with you all now, lighting up the night sky. It sometimes is that if you take your eye off something that might need your eye to hold all which moves, the which that might move will move outside this realm of your steady gaze and will remain unseen by you. And sometimes if you watch steady, your eye trained on the movement that needs to happen, it will not happen. The opportunity of the necessary shift into something else, perhaps needless, will not change into something else like water into wine, the about to happen magic mist held in place by and from the weight of the insistence of your fixed attention. Does it matter? Do we even know that the magic waiting there for you did not happen? The trapeze act of the triple turn in mid air and you there waiting still. The second one is called the armies of the night. If the container will not hold, nor will the contents cracked to leak, porous to leach slowly into the soil, nourishing it, there is no direct say, way to say this. The armies of the, of the night are marching, marching in your dreams. Take back the night you stole, you sleep sound, they knock on the door you hear from both sides of you, you on the inside and you in the room, the both sides of you in sleep. There is justice without you. They fall, the armies of the night, waiting patiently. Never wake a sleepwalker. The hand, the hands of Petrus wrote quietly, eyes vacant of knowledge, whole and intact. Even in your sleep, the history of your beloveds rewritten by them, added to the drift who was, will smile at themselves in their inner camera, take pictures of their food before eating instead of praying. Is this where the cat is silent? Inside the cat, in silent praise, approaches your leg to impart its blessing on your existence. And only he knows, only he knows his existence is owned by the purr inside him, which drones quietly in the background as he praises you. And all in this one moment of time, if you flatten out the truth, making it what was, what has been to serve a shape, a form that it does not have, it retains the memory of its dimensions, the shape, the form, and it returns to form, continues to be whole and intact even in your sleep. So what happened is there, the always flawless and in form, it will stew you to the grave, making what it is serve the shape history forms as it stills you, it, as it stills you in it, it stills you. The intrusive rings false notes as it rings. That's all. Thank you, Leslie. Just so much evolution 
in your language as you discover the truth again and flow with it. It's just brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have Joy Johnson. Thank you for letting me in. <laughs> Um, and I'm sorry I was late uh, and I missed most of the feature and I have a feeling, of course, I missed something precious and I'm sorry about that. But I was at a meeting of uh, the Green Party uh, local chapter. Uh, so you, I just say that to let you know you might not be surprised if a little bit of politics uh, comes into my poems, okay? Um, so the first one is uh, called uh, For Leanne, Solidarity. This sonnet is broken, as broken as the eggs I made and ate for breakfast so that today I could collate that my job, which pays less than an alms tray, but I had eggs to break and fresh peaches, more choice than lots of folks have while they give two speeches, one about number one cop and tropes of number two big felons, all of whom eat better than I. Not really, heavens, because my eggs and peaches come by local proliferation. I'm confocal with the source of, the foundation of, not just this meal, but the force for underpinning utterly everything, life, earth. There's number one, a broken sonnet. I have another uh, kind of broken sonnet, maybe not quite as broken as that one. Uh, it's called uh, Pretend. Um, it, uh, uh, a little bit uh, uh, inspired by a line from a uh, uh, poem, Hotel de Ville by John Tranter. Uh, the line was, I uh, quote, I have wasted my life end quote, and we pay to listen. <laughs> um, make believe. All this product that makes life worthwhile. Did I say that? As if a prophet were required to explain why gases come in and go out, this bundle of wonder arrayed against entropy. The stranger at the door, the one on my pillow of red brocade, but for the difference between in and out, are we not the same, notwithstanding a naval blockade of contrived, inhospitable unfreedoms? So, alike in our essentials, we could approach in the joy of met needs, expenses of shelter, food, and machete sharp and cleaving community, instead of uh, instead what one has and does as opposed to another matters more than amazement at shared biology leading to understanding. I, I did pull up another one that I was remembered about and inspired by Richard's poem about uh, trauma of his past. And I could share that one if you want me to, he's gone, so, but yeah, we got time, okay. I, I think I've probably read this here before, but I've been told that it doesn't matter if you read it more than once. It just gives people another opportunity to understand the, what's going on. So I'll, I, I'm not going to worry about that, and I'll just read this. It is called uh, Vespers. It is based on the poem Obad by Philip Larkin. And yes trigger warning about abuse and so on and language and all kinds of stuff. Okay. You guys. Okay. <laughs> Though I was already a weakened husk, it was you stepbrother Jim who first saw fit at midnight to grope me and your junk. So for decades I knew, but did not all about what death was and what treachery comes visiting men, what women in their memory. There never arose a rhyme or reason to contemplate the end. I was living within it, all while writhing under the burden of their excretions. Too many to recall, really, Nick and Matt and Tommy and Tom, while I was drunk, which was exactly how I coped with tongues of Jimmy and nameless others in the dark. 
it's true that living was not a thing I discerned in me or around, but thy high recognition and no more, I will not and am not inclined to forgive, even if the absent me was in it. This scheme to validate with his come shot. My only life took so very long to make that climb clear of its undone beginnings, to start to recognize its call to meaning, to some kernel of value within the dawns and days and the evenings spent between distraction and whatever transcends the pit I had existed in where men saw no reason not to insert their own significance where was wrote my non-existence. A start to change when, like every good junkie, I hit bottom, awoke in intensive care, knowing that a fundamental sensation had been lacking or overlooked, now was attached. I trawled for years to find within religion, to fasten it in its incubation to what I have to glibly name rebirth. But to be sure, that mothy pretender, a tempter towards splendor, never surpassed sitting still and facing north. Now my life is much nearer its end than where it started and where Clay and Sam and even Bob, who never saw the who I am, nor did I and nor did Ken, who couldn't do calculus, the evening's light filters in, but I don't have attention to fritter on death. That non-beingness acquaintance I already endured. Not fun, but blank. Hard to recall and no ankh needs soothe fears while I bask in youth's sun. Thank you for listening. Wonderful, Joy. Thank you so much. I love how you use the form and you spread your wings within the form, which just blows my mind. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anyone else want to go? I think it may be my turn. Okay. I brought two, and I also have a new chat book that I'd like to share with you. And if you like it, please add a review. And I did take a couple chances, well, one chance with one poem in there that's about my family. And I wonder if that's okay with people. So that's one reason I'd like the review to see what you think. Okay, the first one I wrote recently is called Eternal Plastic Flowers. After the summer rains, green drips over walls of the interstate in the gardens from the massive old growth trees. Eternal plastic flowers and all the graves in the cemetery make me into ash instead, scatter me in the garden we have grown. Plastic blooms on a wreath by the side of the highway. A dear friend, fellow photographer, documented these offerings to the dead. She died so young of cancer, so quietly she retreated. Suddenly she was gone. Every time I see a prayer for the dead, she's on my mind. She sent me a photograph after 9-11, eerie sight of the Twin Towers whole from an earlier trip to New York, a chance shot she caught the angles of shadow and sunlight brilliantly composed. Existential dread in my heart, in my bathrobe, watching the world burn. Bukowski in his own decrying society in the 50s. Even then we could see the poverty, despair, emptiness. Money is not success. I don't think these guys with trophy wives are friends with them. From the darkest hearts of America come the true villains. Who will put plastic flowers on your grave? That's the first one. <laughs> this is a more pleasant one. Uh, this is from the chat book that just got published, which is Poems since 2019. And my dog spiked my hand. <laughs> okay, natural magic. The magic of summer in early June at dusk. Birds chatter with each other across the tops of trees. We're just starting to see the growth in the garden. It will be exponential. Fireflies alight from their hiding places, bringing fairy dust to the foreground of night. 
Do you hear him growling? <laughs> okay. Into the foreground of night. Enter my dream retina. What is to be remembered of this night? We fall. We ascend steps of the subconscious as we fall asleep. Night resurfaces like an ocean of silvery fish. Your imagination is real as dreams. It is the same thing. It's not a video game. It's an AK-15. We can dream better than that. Remember to smile, even with dark humor. A smile still lights up the world. God is a feeling of spirit inside. God is community with others. Angles of wind bent the bending trees. Golden leaves fall in the breeze like cherry blossom petals. Creamy magnolia blossoms celebrate the sky. Shedding petals, now it's June, a blushing bride. Now it's mid-June, and where does all the time go? The few early bees are the only bees for now. Three goldfinches arrive to the first cone flower, then chirp back hello on the telephone wire above us. As I click my tongue, they nod back respect. I welcome them to our flowery oasis. When we began, we were bugs in a pond, ever vigilant, but playing with the surface. It is the time of crisp daisies, dark pink cone flowers facing up to the sun, second flush of scented luscious roses, daylilies rush to be in just one day. Green jade bones are fragile, aching all over but having a day, wait for fatigue to pass each morning and go out to play. When the mosquitoes got so bad in the summers of the 1960s, we'd have to stop playing, call us all inside where they sprayed deet on our suburban street. Jimi Hendrix's voodoo child was background noise to the poison. Now chemicals superfluous in the air. To be like a rose, simply open, flamboyant, fabulous, innocent, all to attract you to her center. She's only there to trade nectar for pollen with you. Nature, life, some kind of master class, class on every level, every day that dawns, a fresh start to breathe, learn, grow. My heart, my body, aching and bruised, healed and soothed by this very natural magic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yes, hearts. <laughs> Thank you all so much. This is a wonderful session. I've had such a great time. Thank you to Tolu and all of our fellow poets. Gosh, it's just so good to see everybody and have such a wonderful time. Thank you all. And I hope you have a blessed day, night, or wherever you are. Thank you.